right, we are studying the book of First Thessalonians in the auditorium Bible class. And so we would invite you to turn to First Thessalonians chapter number one. We spent two weeks on the introduction. Uh, and uh, the book of First and Second Thessalonians uh, are two wonderful books. There is very little doctrinal uh, error to deal with. Uh, it's a book that uh, Paul encourages the church. It's one he started. Uh, that is recorded for us in Acts chapter number 16 and part of 17. And, and we've done all that. So Paul wrote it. Uh, it was written probably early in his ministry. And uh, as I said, it was just a wonderful church with a good testimony. Now, it's been three weeks since I did chapter number one. It's only ten verses. And uh, if you're like me, you probably don't remember a whole lot I said three weeks ago. Anybody want to confess? Ah, oh, I've got one. Okay, very good. Two! All right. Well, that's good because I was going to review chapter one uh, briefly, not in as length as I did and then we want to go on to chapter 2. Now chapter 1, uh, we call it the commendation chapter because Paul commends this church. He commends these believers uh, who turned from idolatry to the Lord and were faithful to the Lord and faithful to the Word. And that's what good Christians do. The modern theology that, well, what you... Make, make a profession, walk out, I'll get baptized, you just go on with your life. It's not true. Uh, salvation and sanctification in the Bible always go together. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, from that day forward begins the process of sanctification, being conformed to the image of Christ. And God has given us all kinds of tools to do that. Uh, the Word of God, prayer, fellow believers, Sunday school, church, good Christian friends. So this is a good church to be an example. Chapter 1 is the commendation uh, of the church. In a minute or in a few minutes when we get to chapter 2, uh, it talks about uh, a good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, that was a chapter that I've been looking at all week and really uh, spoke to my heart. Today, if you are going to be in local church work, you are constantly, especially if you hold to what we call the traditional line. And by the way, those of us that do, we're in the minority. Uh, you're constantly being battered with, well, why do you still have pews? Well, why, why do you still use sandwich? Well, why do you use the old King James? Why, 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 why don't you? Sometimes it's just good to go back and find a chapter like 2 Thessalonians. And it'll show you what the pattern of Christian service is. It'll show you what God's idea of the church is what God's idea of a true servant is. And by the way, invariably, when you look at the Bible, and then you look at this over here, this over here is way off track. Yeah. But because the majority, and by the way, the very fact that the majority approves the new way, that ought to send you a signal right there that something's not right. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just very briefly go through uh, chapter 1 again, it is basically, the whole chapter is the introduction. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. Paul, Silvanus and Timothy, uh, those two were Paul's most consistent, faithful helpers unto the church at Thessalonica. Back then, uh, it was so simple uh, that the churches were simply named for the town. Which is in God the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. A New Testament church 
is one that honors, believes in, adheres to the doctrines of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. No church is a New Testament church that, that bypasses the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul's staggered greeting to the church is, Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago in another study that when Paul wrote to an individual, you can check out Timothy, Titus, he would use grace, mercy, and peace. To the churches, he would usually use uh, first grace and then peace. And that's the correct order. Now, there's no peace without grace. Grace is unmerited favor. And so a church, it's not the building. Uh, that's where we meet. A church, a local church, is a saved, born-again, believing, baptized uh, believers who come together, who are united at one body for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you. Paul's standard M.O. for the church, for any church that he wrote to. Paul had a tremendous prayer life. Have you ever thought about Paul's life? Of course... Isn't it funny, we've got the most modern stuff, we got the fastest stuff, we can zip from here to there, and yet we never have enough time to read our Bibles and pray. Convenience has not made us better Christians. As a matter of fact, I think all the modern conveniences have hurt the church. We got too many toys, and toys take time, and toys will take you away from God. So, we give thanks to God always. He either walked, mostly walked, or he uh, was able to take a, uh, a sail or a rowboat, which was extremely slow, fastest thing going in those days was a donkey. He, had a, he spent so much of his life traveling, and he spent so much of his life incarcerated. He had lots of time to pray. We give thanks to God always for y'all, making mention of you in our prayers. We should not only pray for our church, we should pray for churches of like faith and order. Remembering without ceasing, now chapter, verse number three, is the foundation verse of the whole book. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, there's salvation, and labor of love, there's the Christian life, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, Remember, the key thought of First and Second Thessalonians is the second coming of Jesus Christ, and every chapter has at least one verse in it about that, in the sight of God our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were, among you for your sakes. Now, the statement, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes, that's all played out and explained in chapter 2. But I want you to notice something. Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost. I mean, let me linger there for just a minute. I wish all of you could have been here the last few Wednesday nights. I did a study on the Holy Spirit. Uh, what's happened to the work of the Holy Spirit in the modern church age in our country, and I think probably the entire Western culture is, there is that right or left, whatever you want to call it, a segment, and it's a pretty large segment, that have just taken the ministry of the Holy Spirit and gone nuts with it. I mean, just wild, crazy, fanatical stuff that is no way even the ministry of the Holy Spirit is outlined in the Bible. But what that's done, that's usually taken the more conservative element of churches in America, and we've gone to the other extreme. We've completely shot away from it. That's a mistake. Both sides are a mistake. Two wrongs don't make a right. The Christian life, individually, the church life as a whole, cannot be productive without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit that came in the second you were saved. But then you also have the minister 
of the Holy Spirit to empower and bless the work of God. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. He said, I'll pray the Father. He'll send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Well, what's that one all about? That's to live the Christian life and to serve. I made this statement to the church Wednesday. I'm going to finish that study. Don't do it now, but these songbooks in front of you, there are two things at the end. One is an alphabetical listing of the song. The other is by subject matter. And look under the Holy Spirit and look at those songs and you will see what our parents and grandparents and our forefathers believed about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It won't work without the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul said here. This church had the power of the Holy Spirit on it. That's all he's saying. There's nothing fanatical about that. We're not talking about holy life, speaking in tongues, pew jumping. That, 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 that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to help you live the Christian life and to help us do the ministry that God wants us to do in Stephenville, Texas. Amen. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. In other places, Paul clarifies this statement. You only follow leaders if those leaders are following the Lord. Amen. You don't follow blindly. You follow good men as they're saved, born again, uh, love the Lord, love the people, studying the Bible, praying for them, uh, lead, leading a godly example. And that's Paul, is what Paul was saying. And he became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in truth. Having received the word, that's what we do. Our job is to feed the sheep. Now we do other things, of course. But our assignment from the Lord is to feed the sheep. And we are under constant barrage uh, to, to do social work. The social work that the local church does is to its own members. Amen. Now, we help people out there. We have a food pantry. People come by. We help them. I'm not saying we don't. But uh, don't buy into this that we are responsible for the physical needs of everybody that needs anything out there. Biblically, we're responsible for our own people. Our job is to give people the word. And it came in much affliction. All of the early churches were persecuted churches. Now they were not only persecuted emotionally, they were persecuted physically. Their preachers were arrested. They were booted out from their own families. You came to Christ, you normally lost your job, and you were just as likely to end up homeless, and the church had to pick you up. And there was always constant pressure to run these new churches out of town. Christianity was seen as a very evil thing. By the way, we are quickly moving in that direction again. When we stand against sin that the Bible plainly says we should stand again, we are called hate mongers. In Canada, the Bible is on the ten most hate, hateful literature officially so stated by the government, and we're moving in the same direction. Have you ever thought about this? The very nature of truth is negative. And our modern seminaries are playing right into that. Our younger men are taught you, you don't call anybody a sinner. And uh, you, don't, you don't name sin and, and you don't use the word hell. Not in cussing. I'm talking about in preaching. So... Is the modern church, the true churches, are they now being persecuted? Absolutely. It's not physical yet. It's emotional. And, and churches like ours are the constant pressure to conform to man's ways. I refuse. I'm 77. Shoot me. I ain't giving in. He said, well, you're just a stubborn old cousin. Amen. Put it in writing. In 
much affliction. How many times did Paul say to Timothy, you're a soldier, you're a soldier, fight the fight, fight the fight, it's a war. By the way, stop expecting unbelievers to act like Christians. Did you hear me? Just stop it. How hard is it for us to act like Christians? We are Christians. Don't expect, don't put the code that we're uh, subject to uh, on unbelievers, not till they get saved. Which is another problem in the modern church. Come get saved. Just, it's all right. Just go on. No, 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 no. With joy of the Holy Ghost. There you are again. By the power of the Holy Spirit. So that ye were examples to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. This was a good church. Paul wrote to the church. He said, you're a good church. You're doing right. You are a good example to other churches. You are a good example to the community. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. That's a nice, we have a word for that today called missions. Missions. We support missionaries. We've got seven mission projects. Uh, we've got people that we support that are going to other places on this planet. And what are they going out to do? Preach the word. The gospel, salvation, not only in Macedonia and Cave, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad so that ye need not speak anything. They didn't have to defend themselves. Their life was their testimony. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Here is salvation. How you turn to God from idols and at the same time sanctification to serve the living and the true God. When you become a Christian, Jesus Christ becomes everything. Amen. You give up your idols. What's an idol? Well, it's a statue. No, 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 no. We all know that's an idol. But we have a lot, if we're not careful, we have idols that aren't statues. Someone or something in our life can become more important than God. Then that becomes an idol. They turned to God from idols. No man can serve two masters. And then that precious, precious promise we call the second hope. Uh, there's one of these kind of verses in every chapter of First and Second Thessalonians. And to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Jesus Christ himself in the flesh, who is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, is coming back to earth in the air to take up his church, and then the tribulation, and then seven years later he comes back with us to the earth to set up his kingdom. I want you to notice something else. The last four words. The wrath to come. The wrath to come. First of all, Christians, you are, you've escaped that. That wrath of God to come was meant for you in Jesus Christ on the cross. But Jesus Christ is still coming back to this earth, and God, the Father, will pour out unmitigated wrath, we call the Great Tribulation, on this earth for their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Nobody gets away with anything. We are, especially those of us that are a little older, up in years, uh, the, the, the shift, the anti-Christian, the anti-church shift that we've observed in the last 50 years, uh, you, you know, you sometimes get to thinking, man, is God ever going to come fix this? You better believe he is. It says right here, the wrath will come. When he comes again, it will be in wrath. I don't want to go too far with this, but I don't want to ignore it either. The subject of the love of God today, uh, even in our churches, is a greatly perverted subject. It is a mushy sentiment. Uh, God loves everybody, no matter what. Uh, 
you know, I really need 30 minutes to walk through that, but, but just to make this observation, God is a holy God. Amen. That's right. This morning on the news, I think you've all seen this, and, and, and I'm not advocating that that was right because it was terrible. You just, this mob mentality that attacked this woman uh, Friday night over there in Dallas in the bar section. By the way, if she'd been home in bed in the middle of the night, that wouldn't have happened, but that's another story. That's another sermon. Uh, and she was a transgender. And of course, we know what the Bible says about that. That's wrong. That's sin. They come get us, put me in jail. Sorry, that's not what the Bible says. And so this mob attacked until finally some women stepped in and rescued her. So this morning, they interviewed transgender woman, had long hair, had on a dress, and had a deeper voice than me. <laughs> Sorry, it's not funny, but, but anyway, uh, uh, and of course she was defending that, and the mayor was defending that, and we welcomed the transgender community as being a thriving part of our... <sighs> I'm going to tell you something, that stuff's hard to swallow. Yeah. Anyway, then this woman, this transgender with the deep voice, uh, talking about this other other trans woman and this flower from the flower mine, said, uh, we need to just pray for her. I got news for you folks. That's what's being advocated from the pulpits of America today. Sorry. That's the reality. No, God's holy, and he is coming back in wrath. Yeah. Our job is to get out the gospel and to get as many folks saved as we can reach with the gospel. That's our job. Yeah. That's our job. Our, the church's job is not to straighten out the social order. I wasn't a great follower of Jack Howe, but Jack Howe said a lot of good things. He said, you get enough people saved that the social order will take care of itself. And he was right about that. So there's the introduction. And I'm really killed the whole time. So we are going to, I'm going to be in chapter 2 a while. It's a great chapter. So chapter 2 deals with God's model of a good servant who in this case happened to be the Apostle Paul. So let's get started in chapter 2. We can go about 10 more minutes. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Paul reminds them what he was like when he came. And he reminds them that they, those people, are the product and the proof of his ministry and of his life. And folks, ministry starts in here and goes out there. If it's just out there without anything in here, that won't work. You must be before you can show what you are. Anything else is hypocrisy. And as we work through chapter 2, Paul was, he had it in here. He was right in here. There. And everything he did was an outflow of Christ in him. And so Paul is now, he's going to talk about a model servant, and, and he said, you know what, I came to you, this is what I was like, and you are the proof of that life. Verse 2, but even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul knew suffering, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. But even after that, we had suffered before. Paul never did anything that he didn't suffer for. Physically. How many times was he imprisoned? How many times was he run out of town? 
You go over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in about verse 23 to the end of the chapter. There Paul lists everything that he endured. I've often thought, what a resume. Because <laughs> the last thing in that resume, he says, remember uh, when I left town, they had to uh, put me in a basket and, and, and put me over the wall to get me out of town or they'd have killed me. I, I wonder if in, when, when preachers fill out resumes to try to get to church, and, I, and everybody that knows me knows I hate resumes. What's wrong with a resume? Well, first of all, there's nothing in the Bible about a resume. Um, a resume is something you put your best in and leave out the worst. You put phone numbers down of people that you want them to call and you don't. Nonsense. You know what? There are no perfect preachers. We're sinners saved by grace. We don't do everything right. The only thing perfect about my life is this right here. And these churches are always looking for perfect men. What a waste of time. How do you find God's man? You get on your knees for God tells you who you're supposed to have. But Paul was a man who suffered. And of course at Philippi, which is a great lesson in humanity, when he first got there, they worshipped him as a god. Next day, they stoned him. Old Vance Habner had an old saying, uh, back from uh, the early 1900s, he would say, talking about a new preacher coming to town, he'd say, the family that is the first to meet you at the, grain st at the train station will usually be the first family that's going to want to take you back to the train station. <laughs> Paul, he suffered terribly at Philippi. And we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. I... You know, we talk about having politicians today instead of political leaders. Well, I got, I got a news flash for you. I think we got too many men pleasers in the pulpit, not bold preachers. Yeah. Late uh, Bob Jones Sr. used to say, do right, will the world fall. I mean, come on, is God able to protect us still? Mm -hmm. I think he is. Paul was a man who suffered for the faith but kept on preaching. How many times he got booted out of a town? How many times he got put in jail? How many times he got beaten up? He got up the next day, went to the next town, and started preaching. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in God. Three very strong words. He did not deceive. He was not deceived. He was real. He wasn't pious high. He was always real. What you saw is what you got. Nor of uncleanness. He lived a clean life. He lived what he was preaching. Not in guile. He wasn't beguiling or deceiving people for personal gain. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Now the word allow in our modern language is not the strength of the word allow. Uh, that It's the correct translation, I mean it's the correct word obviously. Uh, but it's a much stronger word in the Greek in which that was written than it is in our modern language. It literally means commit. God saved Paul, God called Paul, and God committed him. He had a call from God, a strong, uh, unbending call from God. That's what it means. But we were allowed of God. We put in trust with the gospel. The gospel is a trust. We use the word trust in our modern language, mostly correctly, in that it stands for we trust the bank with our money. We trust our financial advisors with our whatevers. It's something valuable. It's something that we don't want to fall in our own hands. Uh, it's something that we're looking forward to, to produce for us in the future. The gospel. 
most valuable thing that I have in my life is the gospel. It's a trust from God, and I must be true to it. But we're allowed of God to put trust with the gospel. Even so we speak. Paul said, I spoke the truth. God gave me the gospel. It, it, it was the truth, and I preached the truth to you. And then he adds, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. To another church, I think it's the Galatian church, Paul said, if I should yet please men, I should not be the servant of God. Don't get me wrong on this. I need you to listen very carefully so you can get this wrong. I appreciate the society in which we live where everybody, most everybody makes a living and if you've got money and we take offerings and tithes here at the church like we're supposed to and that's how we operate this ministry and we operate strictly on what comes in. We don't owe anybody the money. We don't go to the banks. We don't go to godless people. Uh, this church operates strictly on what you give on Sunday morning and, and part of that pays me uh, a, a salary and I'm able to give most of my time uh, to this church, that's a wonderful blessing. Uh, I'll tell you honestly, though, preachers being paid a set salary has caused some enormous problems to the ministry in that they get to be holding that salary and the people who give it. And our churches, I don't know if anybody like that here, and I don't want to know, I don't know who gives what, I don't want to know. That way I treat everybody alike, and I don't get partial. I've seen an awful lot of it, uh, they, they, these, people, they, these guys get this nice salary and then they're beholden to certain people and, and it, they have to trim their message to please the audience that gives them the check. So salaries has a very good side, but salaries, if, if you're not careful, can also be a very, you end up pleasing men instead of God. Not pleasing men. And let me tell you something, that's easy, that, that's just not pleasing men, that just rolls off the lips, so easy, that's a tough one, that's a tough one. And, and, and most of them are little things, but every once in a while it's, it's really a big thing, that you've got to decide, that's wrong and that's right, and I'm going to do right and trust God, and if they fire me, so what? And I have experienced being fired for preaching the truth, so I know what I'm talking about here. I'm not just playing games up here. Not pleasing men, pleasing God. My job is to please my master, Amen. my Lord Jesus Christ, who put me in this thing. And I have to give an account for what I've done here. And I have to give an account for every one of you uh, as, as, to, as to how I've helped you or I've hurt you. I, I'm accountable to God. I'm, uh, people talk about, well, you're a preacher. You just work on Sunday. and, 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 and No, you kidding? I got the toughest master in the universe. And he knows everything and he sees everything. And I have to give an account for everything. Which tries our heart. God knows my motives. God knows your motives. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. First of all, God's witness to everything we do. I'm not supposed to use flattering words to make it feel good. No, I'm not supposed to be ugly. But words, sweet, lovable words, just to make you feel mushy all over? No. As you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. <clears throat> I think we have a great problem in because of financial uh, prosperity as our country has been so richly blessed that uh, if we're not careful, we get covetous and we want what other people want. I'm sorry, I'm a little old-fashioned like this, but you've heard me say this before. I don't think preachers need to live above their congregations. If everybody in the congregation drives a new Chevy, you drive a new Chevy. If everybody in the congregation lives in a medium-sized home, you live in a medium-sized home. This baloney that has gotten so big in our pulpits of America today that the preacher is supposed to live like a king. No, that's the next life. This is a life of service and suffering and doing whatever it takes 
to get the job done. Covetousness has no place in the Christian's life. By the way, Paul said to the Colossian church, covetousness is idolatry. And Revelation says no idolater shall have a place in the kingdom of God. And God is our witness. Now, to verse 6, and I got to quit. Nor of men sought we glory. Neither of you, nor yet of others. God keeps the scores, not you and me. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, that I'll have to get into next week. So, uh, we are going to stop at verse number 6, and uh, we'll review a little bit, but we'll, we'll start up with verse number 7 next Sunday. So, Paul was a good example. He's a good man. Suffered a lot for Christ. I laid a tremendous foundation for the Christian faith that we're supposed to follow. Him. So, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the word. Whatever we need, it's there. Lord, help us to be true to you, me individually, and at home and in public and at the church and at this church. Doesn't matter what everybody else is saying, how it ought to, how it ought to be done. What's important is what do you say? What's your command? Help us to be true to you. And if that means going against the stream of popular opinion and the tide, so be it. Paul certainly did. And so, Father, I pray you bless this study to our hearts and to our lives. I bless our service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.